Hi, welcome to this new episode of Digging for Truth, sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research. On our program, we love talking about historical evidence and archaeological evidence connected to the reliability of the Bible. The central event that's recorded in the Bible, in the New Testament, is the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, the physical bodily resurrection from the dead. Over the centuries, many people have asked, is this a real event that happened in real history? And if so, what are the implications for this great event? Well, we're going to talk about it in two episodes today because it's so important and so extensive and so critical for our understanding of history and of the Bible. To do so, we have a special guest joining us today, Mr. Tim Chafee from Answers in Genesis Ministries and also Risen Ministries. We want to welcome Tim to the program. Tim, it's great to see you and it's great to have you here. Henry, great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me uh, to talk about this this really important topic. Yeah, we're well, we're we're excited to have you on board. Um, uh, obviously, in my introduction, we talked about the resurrection, and that's going to be our 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 main focus in the next two uh, this episode and the next one. Uh, but I would like you to do a little bit before we jump into that is just share with the audience a little bit about your ministry, what you do uh, at Answers in Genesis, and particularly. Uh, in your interest and passion about the resurrection. Sure. Yeah, I'm the content manager for the attractions division at Answers in Genesis. Uh, that's essentially the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, which your audience may have heard of those. Uh, yes. The Ark Encounter, the full-size Noah's Ark, about 45 minutes south of Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, being the content manager means that I'm responsible for writing uh, the the text for the uh, for the exhibits and uh, for any of the video and audio scripts that you'll that you'll encounter when you go through the ark and uh, I do the same thing for the creation museum now as well for the last few years uh, so it's really a privilege to uh, be a part of this ministry work with so many extremely talented people and uh, as you know the uh, answers in Genesis is dedicated to upholding the authority of God's word right and uh, so that's something that I'm always excited to do that's why I uh, started Risen Ministries. Originally, it was called Midwest Apologetics. That was way back in 2005 that I started that. Yes. And it's something I've always done on the side, and uh, I've been able to continue to do that. And um, so it's that's part of a, a writing and speaking ministry that I do on the side. That's a, that's really good, uh, Tim. Uh, we just want to say for our audience, uh, someday we're going to have you back to talk about the Ark Encounter. My family. Okay. Oh, that my, sounds great. Yeah, we'd love to have you. My my family and I went to there on vacation, and it is fantastic. Full size Noah's Ark, and we'll leave that for the audience to think about. And so we'll come back around to that sometime. But we're going to focus today on the resurrection, and we're going to get right into it. We're going to get into the New Testament text a little bit, and we're gonna we're gonna sort of unpack uh, the presentation of the resurrection and some historical evidence and arguments that are out there, skeptics. Uh, defenders of the resurrection, all that kind of thing. So let's begin with sort of the eyewitness nature of the resurrection as it's recorded in the New Testament. Because this is, this is really important. People just sort of generically understand, okay, the New Testament says Jesus was raised from the dead. But actually, the, the eyewitness nature of it in the details is very interesting. Why don't you go ahead and just begin expanding on that a little bit. Yeah, Luke tells us in uh, Acts 1-3 that after his sufferings, after the crucifixion, Jesus presented himself alive by many infallible proofs. And so I asked people what would be an infallible proof that somebody that you knew had died was now alive again. And of course, the first thing that you think of is that you see him. And that's what the New Testament tells us over and over again. Uh, it's really interesting that the, the Bible never says that somebody watched him rise from the dead. You know, you think if you were making this up, that would be kind of a, a key thing. You'd want to see that happening. But you don't need to have that in order to have a resurrection. What you need is proof that he was dead and then proof that they saw him alive again. There's only one explanation of how that happens. He, he came back to life. Yes. And so you have multiple eyewitnesses in the gospel accounts. Of course, the first one is uh, Mary Magdalene. She gets to see Jesus uh, before anybody else does. And then the, the other women, and then you have uh, you have Peter, then you have the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, then you have the, the rest of the disciples that evening back in Jerusalem. And then later on, they see him in Galilee. Uh, one of them, one appearance is to seven of them at the Sea of Galilee. And then there's also the appearance at the Galilean hillside, and then back in Jerusalem before the ascension. So Jesus appears to them multiple times and show that, that he's alive again. 
Yeah, it's it, interesting the the sort of spectrum that you just went over of the different and the different nature of, of those different witnesses. You know, Mary Magdalene being uh, the first, right? Um, mm-hmm. But then you have also Peter, who had betrayed Jesus, right? So yeah. so you have that development, and you had a couple skeptics in there that we need to talk about real quick. Uh, James and Paul, why don't you talk about that just a little? Uh, yeah, I think that's that's so important to talk about those two because oftentimes we'll hear skeptics say, well, Jesus only appeared to his followers, so they obviously were making this up, but that's just not true. Uh, James was somebody who was the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, he was the son of Mary and Joseph. And during Jesus' ministry, it says that even his brothers did not believe in him. That's in John 7. Uh, Mark 3 goes even further, says that his his family tried to prevent him from speaking, saying that he was out of his mind. Yeah. So his his family didn't believe in him. Uh, which is a little strange. You'd think that Mary could have set them straight and said, hey, guys, let me tell you what happened before your older brother was born. Uh, she she should have been able to pass that on, but it would be hard to take it if your brother said that he was the son of God and that he went around claiming to be the Messiah. Um, yes. but, um, so, but then by the time of the upper room, by the time of Acts chapter 1, James is a believer. Well, what happened? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that he appeared to James. And then, of course, Paul is the church's greatest persecutor. He goes around uh, arresting Christians, uh, not just in Israel. He's even going outside of his country, he's going into foreign lands to arrest them and even casting his vote against them to kill them. So he's persecuting Christians to the death. And I like to say uh, in Acts chapter 9, Paul saw the light. And that's when Jesus appeared to him on the road yeah. to Damascus. Yeah, this is interesting. So not only those who intimately knew him, which you alluded to, in the beginning, but those who either either were indifferent or didn't believe, as in James, it doesn't seem like James was opposed to him, but it, he just couldn't get he couldn't get on board. And then right. Paul, Paul was effectively killing people uh, in the name of opposing the gospel. It's quite extraordinary. It is. I mean, it would. It, it's it's almost if you could think of um, somebody in our day being. Uh, maybe a jihadist or something like that, trying to kill Christians, and then suddenly their entire life changes to the point where they are uh, willing to promote the gospel wherever they go, uh, even to the point of persecution and death. And uh, that's really what Paul was like. He was so zealous for his faith, thinking that he was doing the right thing, thinking that he was obeying God while he was trying to stamp out Christianity because he viewed it as this heretical sect. And uh, then he came to understand the truth that no, that Christianity is, is the truth because Jesus really is the Messiah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's that's very good. Jesus and Jesus, in fact, warned his disciples that a time is coming when people will claim to be uh, doing the will of God and will attempt to kill you. Uh, so that that does happen. Obviously, it happened as has happened in history. So while we've wrapped up our first section here, folks, we're going to pick up with this discussion about the witnesses to the resurrection, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the nature of that. We're going to expand on uh, things like Paul and James, but there's other elements found in the resurrection narratives that help us see it's historical, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm joined today by Mr. Tim Chafee, uh, who uh, is discussing with us the resurrection of Jesus. And we're walking through some of the narrative in the New Testament and the details of the text uh, to lay a foundation to discuss this as an historical, actual event that occurred in history. In fact, the central event in all of human history. So, Tim, uh, we talked a, a little bit, we laid the foundation in the first segment just to talk about some of the eyewitnesses, the different nature of them. We talked about Paul and James, of course, being skeptics. Uh, let's build on that a little bit. Uh, the, let's talk about the nature of the accounts a little. Uh, they did not merely just see Jesus. In other words, he was just some vision off in the distance or some phantom or ghost kind of idea. 
But there's actually much more to these, the nature of these, of these uh, accounts. Uh, why don't you go ahead and begin with that, and let's, uh, let's talk about that. Yeah, I think that's really important because, you know, um, we, we often hear people say seeing is believing, but we also know your senses can fool you a little bit. And uh, sometimes you see a mirage. Sometimes uh, you hear people say, well, you're only seeing what you want to see. And, uh, you know, when somebody is really grieving, uh, you know, maybe that's a possibility that that um, you're you see somebody who looks like Jesus a little bit in the distance and you you want it so badly to be him. But that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that Mary Magdalene, that she clung to him. So she, she touching him. Uh, the other women uh, that they also uh, clung to him, that they, uh, you know, that they, they they just wanted to be around him. They didn't want to let him go. But then you have Jesus eating in front of the disciples. He, he drinks something in front of the disciples. You know, he breaks bread with them, with the two that are on the road to uh, to Emmaus. And uh, so what Jesus is doing is he's showing that he's not just a, a phantom or a ghost. He's, he's not just this spirit. Um, he's, in fact, it, it's pretty interesting when you dig into this uh, much deeper, and I talk about it in the book, there's a, a study that was done, um, a research paper done about the way that the Greek and Jewish audiences viewed uh, sort of like the different afterlife concepts, whether it was a revenant or a phantom, those kind of things. And what Luke does, just in his gospel, he goes through uh, each of those things, showing he's, Jesus isn't one of those. He's something different. He, he has all of these. It's the actual physical bodily resurrection. It's the person who was alive before is now back in that same physical yet transformed body. Yes. So it's very different than what the Greeks and the Jews expected. Yeah, what they, what they expected, that's right. And you mentioned your book, and we're going to put that up on the screen and let people know about that, In Defense of Easter. And it's really excellent. We're, we're working through here uh, elements of that. And I just want to encourage the audience to uh, consider picking up a copy of Tim's book at his website because uh, that will give a lot more information than what our two episodes will and really uh, give really solid reasons that we should believe in the resurrection. Uh, a couple of things that you touched on here, Tim, this, this, uh, it's so interesting that Jesus broke bread and he ate fish and a honeycomb. Uh, ghosts don't do that, do they? No, no. I remember Ghostbusters with what Slimer trying to drink stuff and going right through him. That's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Not what's happening. There you go. It's I know that's not a historical document, but no, no, no. But it's, still, it's sort of silly anecdote. But I think, I think, kind of in a funny way, it bring, draws out the point of um, a ghost could be a false vision of some kind. Mm -hmm. uh, but these variegated. Uh, d different types of experiences that they had, I think it was God's way of sort of pigeonholing the whole thing, if you want to say it that way. Look, this is not just a hallucination or a vision. This is, this is r a real person, physically resurrected, and these are evidences for it. Um, yeah, you, I go think ahead. you're exactly go ahead. right. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. It's, I like that you use that term pigeonholing. It's like any sort of excuse that you're going to come up with, any alternative theory that you're going to try to use to explain away the evidence, it's too bad. It doesn't work. And, and we're going to see that. I think we're going to talk more about that in the, the second part. But that's what's happening here. I mean, Jesus even invites Thomas to touch him. You know, Thomas said, I'm not going to believe until I put my hand in the nail scars. Well, when Jesus showed up eight days later and Thomas is there, he says, go ahead, Thomas. And of course, the Bible never tells us that Thomas did. Thomas just replied, said, my Lord and my God. Yeah. And I like to say that that's the correct response to Jesus Christ, because that's who he is. Yeah, that, 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 that's interesting. I, I never noticed that in the narrative before. You, I guess you assume from the narrative that he would have done it, right? I mean, I mean, there he is saying he's a skeptic. He's not, I'm not going to believe this. And, mm -hmm. and, and instead, out of his very soul comes this declaration of who Jesus is. He finally believes. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, and it's interesting, maybe Thomas gets a little bit of a bad rap because he's really not asking for anything that the other disciples didn't ask for. You know, when Mary and the other women appear to the disciples and say, hey, he's risen, um, they didn't believe until they saw him. Yeah. And so Thomas wasn't there that first time when he appeared to everyone, and he's just asking for the same thing that they were. But, um, you know, he had more eyewitnesses telling him about it. Maybe he should have <laughs> believed right away. Yeah, sure. But, you know, some sometimes I think there's a lesson in there, too, a spiritual lesson, you know, um, if, if, if there is in there a heart of sincerity, maybe conflicted, right? Mm -hmm. God will sometimes uh, often reach to us and yeah. give us what we need. You know, that's what Thomas, that's what Thomas needed. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he needed something a little bit more substantial, and the Lord certainly gave it to him.
Yeah, I think that's a great point. I like to tell people that, you know, God isn't afraid of our questions. There's nothing wrong with asking questions of Scripture, but are you asking it with an intent to seek the truth, to learn? Or are you are your questions intended to just try to find fault, to try to um, create problems? Uh, you know, are you doing it out of skepticism or out of uh, sincerity? Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's really good. Another another little thing I noticed when I was 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 preparing for our interview, why the biblical author uh, John would have said, okay, so Jesus performs a miracle in uh, John twenty. And then the disciples capture fish, not a lot of fish, not some fish, but 153. Maybe you could come on, uh, comment on that a little bit. It speaks of eyewitness testimony. It does. Why would you just make up some crazy number? You know, there are some people who try to assign certain meaning to that number. Oh, it's all the nations. All the, and I don't, we really don't know exactly why that number, other than the fact that he was there and, and John was there. He was part of the counting process. And uh, something else that Jesus does there, you mentioned Peter earlier in our first segment, you know, Peter denied Jesus three times. And at that point, during that appearance at the Sea of Galilee, Jesus restores Peter because he, you know, asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? And so he's, he, it's a beautiful way of Jesus restoring Peter back into the fold and uh, essentially telling him to, to lead this group. Yeah, I think, and I think that's a good anecdote for those watching the show who may may uh, not fully understand the resurrection or not believe the resurrection. That one of the purposes of it, the many purposes of, it, is reconciliation to God, and Jesus does that through His death. But the other part of the story is the resurrection, and that is brings the full reconciliation. And Peter experienced that, and so can we. Well, folks, we're finished up with segment two here. We're going to continue with Tim in our third segment, talking about the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And we'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archeological evidence properly interpreted upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Today we're joined by a special friend and guest, Mr. Tim Chafee from Answers in Genesis and from Risen Ministries, and we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus. This episode will be part one of two episodes that we're going to air because of the importance of the resurrection and the evidence related to it. Now, in our, in our third section here, Tim, uh, we're going we're gonna to turn our attention a little bit to sort of crafting an apologetic argument, and then we're going to build on this in part two of our interview with you. Um, there's a scholar named Gary Habermas who you cite in your book quite a bit, and he's done extensive research on the resurrection. He sort of reduces the, uh, the categories that you have to discuss about the resurrection to five minimal facts, he calls them. So let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about those five minimal facts. That'll set up our next episode, but also sort of give a framework for people to work with. So why don't you go ahead and start with that? Yeah, I had uh, Dr. Habermas for a couple of classes in seminary, and he's usually widely recognized as like the go-to guy on the resurrection. This is what he's devoted his life to. And uh, what he did from the mid-1970s, up, and he's still doing it through today, is he's cataloging every single journal article that he can find that has to do with the death and or resurrection of Jesus, whether that's from theological journals, and it doesn't have to be just conservative, that can be liberal, skeptical, critical uh, journals, uh, from scientific journals, law journals, medical journals. If it's published in those places and it is on the resurrection or crucifixion, he's cataloging it. He's saying, what do all these scholars agree on? And he came up with a list of about 12 of them that, um, that more than half of them agree on. And then he said, let's take the top five. And so what he did is put together this list of what he calls the minimal facts. And he uses that as like a, uh, just as a guideline or a framework to say, what is the most likely scenario? What explains these five facts better than anything else? Yeah. And are yeah. there any alternative theories that can explain these five facts? Yeah, that's excellent. So let's, be, let's begin with, uh, that's a good framework to set it up. So he's, 
not just drawing on people who are like-minded, but he's trying to do a, a kaleidoscope of beliefs about the resurrection, people who have well, examined and, it. Yeah, and he's actually slanted it toward the skeptical end of the spectrum because there are very, very few skeptics who have the credential to publish in these journals on this topic because okay. the vast majority of historians or you know, people, experts in these areas will say, yeah, Jesus lived, yeah, he died by crucifixion and those sorts of things. Yeah. So it's very rare to get a skeptic who will deny those things. So sometimes people who aren't, don't even have the credentials, he he counts them in there as well. So Okay, so uh, he, he tries to be as fair as he can to the opposing viewpoint is what I hear you saying. Yeah, exactly. And uh, trying to ba balance the evidence. So let's talk about a couple of these. We're going to put them all up on the screen through our discussion here. But the first one is, is the most important to start with, uh, and that is that Jesus was crucified and died. So let's talk about that a little bit, because if you don't have that, then the resurrection is not even a conversation. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, we'll talk about one of the alternative theories that people have come up with, that Jesus faked his own death. He didn't actually die on the cross. But uh, it's it's very well established that Jesus died by crucifixion. Uh, first of all, even if it were possible to take him down from the cross before death, he's most likely going to die. Uh, crucifixion was just a brutal thing. But you even have in John chapter 19 that, that strange statement after um, the soldier pierces Jesus inside with a spear. Yes. And it talks about blood and water coming out. Yes. Uh, and then John makes the statement like, and he who has seen has believed and he knows his testimony is true. And he's it's like, John is saying, I know this sounds really weird, but that's what I saw. And yeah. then we look at that today from a medical perspective and say, yeah, that's exactly what somebody, what would happen to somebody who's gone through the beatings that Jesus has gone through. You'd have a, a, a you know, some fluid around the heart and around the lungs. And that's what's being punctured by that spear that causes the blood and the water to come on out. And so now modern medicine looked back at that and said, yes, somebody must have seen that happen. John writing that gospel must have witnessed that Jesus was dead. Yeah, he would have never known that particular medical phenomenon without having witnessed the spear go into him and the fluid come out. The other, right. the other part of this is, uh, you know, the Romans were experts at crucifixion. I mean, they, they, were, they were expert executors. Why don't you come yeah. on that a little bit? Well, that was their job. I mean... The, if if the guy leading the the company down at the cross, you know, if if somehow the guy gets off the cross, or if somehow he doesn't die on the cross, then this guy's going to lose his life. But they were they were I mean they crucified people on a regular basis. They knew what death looked like, what it sounded like, what it smelled like. Uh, they they were experts at it, and uh, you know usually they would break the person's legs to guarantee you know if they had to get him off the cross quickly like they did in this case. But when they came to Jesus, he's already dead. So they punctured the side with a spear just to make sure. And if he was still alive in some way, if the lungs were still working, you would hear that coming up because the lung would have been punctured. Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, and they didn't. We we see that he, they didn't need to break his legs because they confirmed his death through the spear. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a, a prophecy too that's connected to that: is his bones won't be broken. It's very, very interesting. So he died before that. A lot of that was due to his uh, being flogged. Too. Mm -hmm. It was a horrific, well, it, horrific, horrific way to die. It really is. And I think it also is that he's in control of when he's going to die. It's, it's not until the last prophecy is fulfilled when he says, I thirst, and then he drinks the, you know, what the, is offered to him yeah. on the sponge. And at that point, then he says, it is finished. Every, it's all been done. Now I can die. And he gave up his life willingly. He, he knew when it was time to die. And that's when he, when he did. Very good. So now, uh, Let's let's jump to number five on our list. Uh, you got about a, we'll have about a minute, and then I'll finish up the show, and then we're going to move to to show number two. So folks are going to hang on for next week because we've got more exciting stuff to talk about. Let's just lay the foundation for the minimal fact of the tomb was empty. Yeah, this is what is so important because you know the scholars do recognize these different facts: the eyewitnesses, the conversion of James and Paul, and then the tomb being empty is number five. And what has to happen if you're a skeptic, if you're denying the resurrection, you have to account for why did people see him again? You know, that vision or, or hallucination or whatever. But why was the tomb empty? Because those don't explain the empty tomb. And so people came up with all sorts of hypotheses to try to explain the empty tomb. In fact, that was what the Jewish leaders were trying to do on that first day, yes. uh, trying to explain how the tomb became empty. And so there's all sorts of interesting um, explanations that I think we'll explore in the next part. Yes, certainly. So, Tim, thank you for joining us for this part about the resurrection, folks. Uh, and thank you for joining us today on this episode of Digging for Truth as we're exploring the resurre resurrection of Jesus.
We're going to build upon this episode. We're going to talk about the empty tomb and why the only explanation that makes any sense logically, historically, and biblically is the resurrected Jesus. His body was not stolen. The disciples didn't lie. We're going to talk about all of that in our next episode. Thank you for joining us today as we talked about this glorious subject of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 